welcome. It's good to see each of you here this evening. I think I know most everybody who's here. I'm Dr. Michael O'Dell, and uh, I uh, have appreciated the, the work of Chad and Fadia Cruiser. They're from up in Michigan, and they've come to talk to us about tonight. We're going to talk about stress and anxiety. And I know that all of us deal with stress. If you live in this whole world, you have stress. That's just, that's, it's, we're programmed that way. But how we handle it is really the thing. And I think we'll learn some tricks tonight for that. I know those of you who had the privilege of being here last night and learning, I think uh, we'll learn more tonight. I think uh, when we talked about addiction last night and everything, it was, it was interesting because I think in, in a subtle way, probably all of us have our little addictions to things. So we'll get started tonight right away and we'll have prayer to begin with. Gracious Lord, you are a great and loving God and you have created us in a marvelous way. And Lord, we love you and we want to serve you. Tonight, as we try to learn better how to handle the stresses of life, we pray that you will guide our minds and guide our speakers as they bring us truth for these days. In Christ's precious name we pray, amen. Good evening. Good evening. How was your day? Great. Oh. Well, it was nice to have some sun today. That was fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Got out in, in nature a bit today, and that was a great experience. And tonight, we're going to talk about overcoming stress and anxiety. And more and more people are struggling with this today especially since COVID. We're seeing more and more people struggling with it. We looked at some of the stats yesterday. And before we begin tonight, let's bow our heads for another word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to look at science and scripture, two books you've given to us. You've given us the book of nature and the book of revelation. Lord, I pray that as we study together that your Holy Spirit would rain down. In Jesus' name, amen. I was reading a book a number of years ago, and it talked about something. It was called The Survivor's Club. It was a medical doctor who suggested it to me, and I went and got it and read it. It was absolutely fascinating. And it talked about something that they called the 80-10-10 principle. And what they suggest is that when you look at people who are going through extremely traumatic times, we're not talking about, you know, you got a little hectic job or, or you're at work. We're talking about catastrophic situations that are life or death, that about, about 80% of people, when a, like a life and death situation takes over, they kind of wait for somebody to tell them what to do. I'll, we'll give you an illustration in just a moment. Another 10% of people absolutely freeze. They become useless. They can't do anything. And another 10% of people actively look for a way out of the situation. That's the 80-10-10 principle. And so they give the exam example of the Titanic. And you've probably heard some of the history of the Titanic. I mean, surely we've all heard of it. But what happened was there were 20 different lifeboats, and each lifeboat would fit 65 people. And the people were told that the boat's going to sink. And as they're told the boat is going to sink, they're asking people to get on, you know, and, and, and so people are, they say the first lifeboat, 65 could get on, and 12 people got on the lifeboat. So there goes a lifeboat with 12 people on it made to hold 60. And so what happens? Now, the question is, when all the boats launched, it was too late. And by that time, people were ready to get on. They're like, oh, hey, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. But it was actually too late. Those boats had gone. And there was, for those people, many of those people ended up obviously dying. But what are the reasons for not getting on the boat? We, we can only obviously guess. We don't know for sure. Uh, some of the reasons might be things like uh, fear. Uh, this boat seems bigger than that little boat, so I don't think I want to get on that thing. 
and so they stayed on the large boat even as it was getting to the point where they were going to sink. And maybe it was, you know, in difficult situations, you may be afraid of looking different. For instance, what typically happens? We actually, when we learned about this book, maybe you can tell the experience about when the doctor told us about the book. We were at a conference in a big convention center, you know, like the kind they have that are attached to Marriott's and all these in the, in the, in the cities. And there are probably thousands of people sitting there. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the speaker's up there, and the alarm system, the, the fire alarm goes off. So everybody's kind of looking around like, what do we do? And 80% are looking for what? Somebody to tell them what to do. In this, this case, it would seem more like about 99%. <laughs> but we saw one doctor friend walking out. He walked right by us. He walked right by us, and he was walking out. And so I said to Chad, I said, do you think we should follow him? He's like, and I'm glad she asked that because I wouldn't have actually done it if she didn't ask me. But my wise <laughs> wife asked me, do you think we should just go with him? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? So we followed him out and we went out and talked to him and we said, why did you leave? And he told us he read this book, The Survivor's Club. And he said, people wait to hear from up front or somebody in authority come and tell them what to do. And then a lot of times if it's a real fire, it's too late. They'll trample each other and kill each other on the way out. He said, so in this book, it just told us, you get out as soon as you hear that fire alarm, and if it's a false alarm, well, great, come back and sit down. But if it's not, you don't want to be trampled on your way out. And so we were like, wow, that's so interesting. And so then in the book, there's another 10% that get in the way of those that are trying to find a solution. Like on the deck of the Titanic, they literally will just freeze. The boat is going down. They don't try to tread water. They are just frozen, and they just they go down with the ship. I mean, they've literally lost their capacity to try to even act. And so uh, as we, you know, we learned about the book in the context of somebody actually going in one of these situations, now obviously almost every time the alarm goes off, it's a false alarm, right? Somebody pulled the alarm or whatever. But I finally realized, hey, you know what? I'll just go out anyway. And you think, ah, that looks foolish. Are you afraid to die? I'm actually really not really afraid to die. I just don't want death to be my fault. <laughs> right? Like if I, I mean, I'd rather live, to be honest with you, but if something happened where I had to die, well, that's all there is to it. If it's an accident or something happens, but it's like if I knew, hey, I knew there was really a potential chance something could have happened. The chance may be slim, but there's still a chance. And so, you know, maybe it's wise to actually act upon it. And acting upon it can actually lower your stress level simultaneously. Does that make sense? Because what we just saw during COVID, one of the difficulties of COVID was that what were most people doing during COVID, or at least many hundreds of thousands or millions actually people doing in the United States during COVID? You're sitting at home, you're watching, today there were 3,000 deaths, today there were 5,000 deaths, and, and, and you're seeing these numbers go up, and what were you doing about it? Most people were doing nothing, and because you do nothing, what happens? It increases stress levels, right? But when we act upon this, when we realize, okay, things are happening, there are certain things I can do. And so, for instance, if I'm struggling with weight, we knew very early on that the people who are some of the most likely to die were people who were overweight. Well, what could you do? Well, you could stare at the screen and be terrified all day, or you could say, hey, you know what? There's been no better time in history for me to maybe try to change my lifestyle, right? And so acting upon something can actually motivate you, and it can simultaneously lower your stress. And, you know, some of the reasons people may not have been getting on the Titanic is other people weren't doing it, and they didn't want to look like an alarmist. But, hey, actively doing something, though you can imagine how happy those first 12 people who got on the, on the boat that could hold 60, 65 people, they were very happy that they did that, right? And there were 2,208 people on board, and only 705 survived. But it didn't need to be that way. In reality, fear can save you. So fear is not always a bad thing. For example, we have a friend uh, who did overseas missions in the country of Congo, and their family was coming to visit them to help them out at the mission. And the plane that they were taking uh, crashed into a village uh, market. And when it crashed, th the young lady, she was in her teens, uh, immediately was looking for a solution. 
She didn't wait for, uh, others are just sitting in there in, in the plane waiting for someone to tell them what to do. She and the guy sitting next to her immediately got going and they started pulling apart the airplane. It's hard to believe it, but they actually, there was a hole and they began to rip open a young lady with, with another man there and they literally ripped open a hole big enough that they were able to save save everybody on, on board. And um, she was separated from her family. She didn't even know if they made it or not. Uh, her, her brother broke his hip. He was just a little guy. And she was probably really 13, 14, yeah. maybe 15, yeah. but I don't even think she was 15. But that fear didn't, you know, make her just sit and wait for someone to tell her what to do. She was proactive, and in her proactivity, or if that's the correct word, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, she was able not to only save her own life, but her families and other people on board. Isn't that beautiful? So think about it. Now, instead of having flashbacks of woulda, coulda, shoulda, she has, wow, the Lord used me to help these people and I'm alive today because of that. You know, I think that's just such a beautiful thing. And it's so important that we, we think about these things in terms of everyday life and how we allow stressors to either make us fear to the point where we're paralyzed or fear to action. And the reason we bring this up in the context of overcoming habits is because often it's anxiety and stress that cause us to go for the cigarette, to go for the coffee, to go for, you know, wasting time on the internet. You're, you're stressed. I got work to do, but oh, I'd just feel better if I could get rid of the stress. And so you just waste time on the internet, whatever it is. But we're going to talk now a little bit about the an anatomy of fear. The amygdala is this uh, little in the illustration there. It's the an almond shaped portion of the brain that has to do with how we remember and perceive emotions. Researchers have called it the intensity detector. And that's why things in life, uh, the this is a part of the brain that it goes through when you see something terrifying, and so that, that amygdala fires when you see something that is scary. And it says here, boys and girls whose mothers were under distress during their late pregnancy had larger bilateral amygdala volumes and total brain volumes, according to research in Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. It also says, according to JAMA Psychiatry, combat veterans who had PTSD had larger total amygdala volumes than other veterans who did not have PTSD. And we've had the opportunity to meet all around the United States, different veterans, and you find obviously two people who've gone through the very same thing. They may have gone through the very same war. Uh, Fadi had an uncle, he's passed away, actually two uncles who were in war in, uh, Lebanon, that's right. They were in war. It was basically the Christians against the Muslims in Lebanon. And one of her uncles, he cannot talk about it. The other uncle loved to tell stories about the battle and all that took place. He had no trouble with it, right? Two people go through the very same thing. One person, it is traumatic for the rest of their life. Another one, it actually was an enjoyable experience. And I'm not saying whether war should be an enjoyable experience or not, but the point is two people go through different things. And so it can have to do with what's going on with the brain. It can also have to do with how we were actually in our mother's womb. There may be actually factors that make us m more predisposed to anxiety and fear. We have a friend who is uh, more anxious and fearful than her siblings, and she always wondered, like, why? Why am I always the fearful one? And so she asked her mom. She said, Mom, what was my pregnancy like? And she's like, you know what? Actually, that was a very stressful time in our in our lives that during that time of your pregnancy we were going through some rough things and she's like oh it makes total sense she's like why i'm so different from my siblings and it was just the pregnancy was that different from her siblings and so that's why it's so important also that we um, are there for each other even during pregnancy you know we today are so independent we don't need anyone to help us and you know but it's so important to to set up a situation where the mother can be um, taken care of and at peace and, you know, not have all these worries and cares. And you probably heard the illustration about the amygdala, maybe the frontal lobe. It kind of works like this. Maybe you're walking along in your yard and then in front of you, you're terrified because you see a snake right in front of you. And so you're startled and your amygdala fires. And then on closer inspection, you realize actually it's the garden hose, right? And that's the frontal lobe is 
operative telling you, no, 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 it, it looks at the big picture and it realizes, no, 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 yeah, it's kind of the shape of a snake, but in actuality, no, it's just a garden hose. And because your frontal lobe takes over at that point, what happens is you begin to calm down. We looked at the research last night on how they found, uh, they've done, it was a meta-analysis that they did looking at studies on simply deep breathing, like slowing down your breathing, and they said that by doing that, it activates the frontal lobe so that you're better able to analyze a whole situation and not just focus on some fearful situation. One of the things that people are actually in surveys, you may have heard that people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of death. Have you heard that? That statistically people claim to be, and I'll tell you, I was one of those people. I, for the first couple hundred times of speaking, I was so terrified. It was absolutely unbelievable. I, my, my tongue stuck th 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 all over my mouth because my mouth would get so dry that I could hardly speak. I would physically be in pain. It was horrible. But I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. I mean, hundreds and hundreds, I don't know, maybe thousands of times. And now it's not stressful anymore. By doing the same thing often over and over, although it took, you think, hundreds of times, that's pretty rough. It was, it was rough. It was very rough, actually. I heard of a pastor in our church. He was the pastor of the, what's that place that just contacted us today? I don't remember. It's a university out in California. PUC. 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 And the, he was a pastor there, and every single weekend before he spoke, he vomited his entire ministry. All the years of his ministry. He vomited every single time. He just, it was so terrifying to him, but he just kept doing it. I'm glad that I am not terrified anymore. I think I would have died young with the, how much stress it caused me. But praise the Lord, it went away. So sometimes doing the same thing that actually scares you can make but it you better. Did, sorry. You also did change your lifestyle, and that helped a That is deal. true, actually. And we'll talk a little bit about that later as we go forward. And so Jude says in chapter 1, verse 23, many people don't like this kind of verse. That's the one you want to just like cross out. But it's actually a good verse. It says, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the flame. Some people need to have a little fear to actually get saved. Now, you're not going to stay saved just because you're afraid. You're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is righteousness by faith. But at the same time, sometimes people need a, a little bit of fear to shake them up to actually even seek God. And so I know some may not like that, but that's what God says, right? And what do we see? So preparation can lower stress levels. I read that Navy SEALs, 75% of their time in their career is training. You might think, what a waste of time. Imagine any other career that 75% of it is training. Wouldn't that be a waste of time, seemingly? Well, not for them, because in their situations with the extreme stress that they may just give up if, if they hadn't gone through such trying. Actually, they're more likely to die in their training than they are on the battlefield. That's pretty heavy. Uh, but the preparation, the, doing the same thing over and over and over, it lowers stress levels. Fadi, why don't you tell us about Nurse Patricia? So N Nurse Patricia struggled with depression, and she hoped that a frontal lobotomy would help her with her guilt. And what that is is that they would actually go in and with the stylus... Um, destroy some of the frontal lobe and um, yeah not a good way to deal with your depression you don't really hear about this anymore but this used to be a thing but you think about it a lot of us do this in other ways right we deaden the effect of the frontal lobe so that we don't have to think deeply about things right and some ways we can do that is with um, media with food we eat with addictions these are the ways that we're deadening this frontal lobe, this place where you do critical thinking. And, and so maybe Nurse Pat Patricia did something extreme, but we may all be doing this in small ways every day of our lives. But what happened to her before the operation or the procedure? She was in an extremely efficient operating room and she enjoyed reading books. But afterwards, she lost much of her ambition, loss of sympathy and interest in her work and she lost interest in her books, and you would find her saying things like this, I don't care if I make a mistake, it'll turn out all right in the end. Is that how you want um, an OR nurse speaking? No, no right? <laughs> if we make a mistake, big deal. But before, when she was efficient, that was a good thing. And that told you that efficiency came from her frontal lobe. 
and but sadly and then enjoying reading now notice a lot of us struggle with reading and part of the reason is because we watch too much media so then it deadens the frontal lobe and then we don't have a love for reading as much and then it some, feels like I work said, it feels like work to read it, it feels like work to read some of us i said some have stronger brains and they can read even if they do all of that but for the most part um, reading is affected uh, when, you're, when your frontal lobe is affected. And then I have a question. How long does the average initial craving last when you're craving something and you just feel like you have to have it right now? How long do you think that lasts? Anywhere from 30 seconds to 3 minutes. So um, in that time, you can learn to divert the mind. And God has given us things to divert the mind to. He's actually prepared things for us so that we can turn our mind to something better than the cigarette, which was, I struggled with that, right? That was, that was the hardest substance for me to give up. But, uh, drinking wasn't nearly as hard as smoking. Smoking is just very, very difficult. But the good thing is God has given us a way, and we're going to get back to that, to divert our mind to something better, like we talked about last night, to the promises of God. So, for example, when fear sets in, uh, or some negative repetitive thought that you've had, PTSD of some sort, and it comes in and you just go over it and over it and over it, what can you do for that 30 to 60, or, I mean, 30 seconds to three minutes? What can you do? And we're going to talk more about that, but some of the things you can do is, like we said last night, claiming God's promises, having uh, Bible promises actually written and put in your pocket. So that when things like that happen, you do like the things we said, you put your shoulders back, deep breathe, drink some water, and um, also claim the promises and talk to God about it. Like a great one that, yeah, that we looked at last night was Philippians 4 verse 13, which says, what does it say? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, right? So we can do all things. So when we feel like, no, I can't, I have to have a cigarette, we can turn instead to God and his word and say, Father, yeah, I feel like it, but you promise that I can do all things through Christ, that you can give me the victory, and I'm trusting in your power and in your promise. I'm not trusting in my own strength. And sometimes at night is, um, for those who deal with repetitive, negative thinking, sometimes it's at night when you lie down because you kind of go through your day right, and something will come up that you're like, oh, I wish I could have done that, I wish I could, and you can keep yourself up thinking about these things, and one of the things that we do is uh, try to memorize some scripture, and especially if you've mem memorized chapters, it's the best, because it takes you a while to get through the chapters, and just the, the, the act of trying to get through it tires you out, right, and it, it kind of like just makes you fall asleep, and the thing that you're doing, you know, you might think like, well, that's not good, you're falling asleep while you're, you know, uh, going over a Bible, but that's good, that's the last thing that was on your mind is the Word of God, right? That's what I do most every single night, I, almost every single night, I'm going through a chapter of Scripture in my head, and I almost never get to the end of the chapter, because it just tires my brain out, and I fall asleep, and have sound sleep after that, and so claiming God's promises, going over scripture is a, is a powerful one, but I want to look at your brain on sugar. A study of over 1,200 people aged 60 or older found that people who consumed the most refined sugar had high levels of cognitive impairment, had higher levels of cognitive impairment than those who consumed the lowest levels of sugar. And research in, reported in neuroscience and behavioral reviews reveals that consuming higher levels of uh, refined, refined sugar has a detrimental impact on plasticity in the brain, meaning there are unhealthy changes in the brain. High refined sugar consumption may also increase depression, addiction, and anxiety. So this fits together with everything we're talking about here. So refined sugar can make you more prone to addiction, to feel anxious, to be depressed. And so you might be thinking, well... So then last night, what did we talk about is good for the brain? Yeah, because they have the fiber, right? We said the gut bacteria loves, um, well, they're around these things. So you're eating fruit and vegetables that have uh, the bacteria, but then also the fiber that feeds the bacteria. And so then that makes you happier. But then 
here you see, oh, sugar is bad on the brain, but what kind of sugar? So many people think, oh, so you should avoid fruit then. Well, they actually looked at that too. What about fruit? They found the opposite. Those who consume more fruit had better cognitive abilities. So it wasn't detrimental to the memory to be eating fruit. Virtually every study, I know there's some popular doctors on the internet who are marketers like crazy. Buy my supplement, buy this for me. You've got to do this with me and, and don't eat fruit and especially sweet fruit because sweet fruit's terrible for you. It's bad for your health. It's bad for diabetes. And Actually, the research shows time and time again, British Medical Journal looking over 100,000 people that fruit consumption actually generally lowers the risk of things like type 2 diabetes. Now, it is actually true that melons, for those who are, uh, have insulin resistance, those who may have diabetes, they can really spike the blood sugar. But uh, especially if you remove the high-fat diet, you can eat plenty of carbs in their natural form, not sugar, but in the natural form, which is fruit, it actually can enhance cognitive abilities. So the, for those that are doing the modified fast, uh, and we told you yesterday, what, what did we tell you to eat for the first day? Fruit. But then if you are a heavy alcoholic or a drug addict or a diabetic, you were to do the fruit, veggies, grains, uh, and beans for the whole week and water. Uh, but for those that are trying the one thing per day, so adding, one thing, adding right. one thing per day, so yesterday you had the fruit, and to that fruit, or today. or today you had that, and so then for tomorrow you will add vegetables to your fruit, but not at the same meal. So you could do breakfast as fruit, and then lunch you could do as veggies. Unless you really want to do veggies for breakfast and fruit for lunch, you're welcome to do that too. Some people actually do that. You can Either way you can do it. And then remember, we're not adding any refined foods um, to our food. Um, we're just eating them whole. You can cook them, but you eat them whole. So what I mean by that is you're not adding sugar, you're not adding uh, oil. You can add salt, but, you know, don't overdo it. That's all. Well... We've actually talked about, I'm just going to share with you a quick few slides, and the reason we're sharing it is because in the midst of anxiety, addiction, and depression, we've gone into great, much more detail into the impact on the gut, and we're not going to do that tonight, but I want to talk about one thing that can make you more prone to addiction. It's a health food that is promoted all over the place. People say, oh, this is very good for you. It doesn't have uh, you know, negative side effects. It only has positive side effects. And it does actually have some positive side effects, but it is a health food that could actually make you more prone to addiction, depression, and anxiety. And what is that? And for you, this is one thing that really changed things yes. for you. Yes, I actually think this is one of the m most important things in me f feeling like a different person and not feeling like an addict. And it's something that also, well, let's, we'll just share with you what it is, we'll tell you more about it. So we've looked at this here before, but we're only looking at a few slides on it. And like I said, we could go into many more studies, but what about spices and alcohol addiction? Now this is correlation. I have several studies that are not correlative. They're actually giving people things, testing them, and actually seeing the causation. But here's just a correlative study. In the journal Psychiatry Investigation, researchers looked at people's preference for spicy food and also their genetics. In the conclusion of the study, they state a strong preference for spicy food can be assumed to be a risk factor for alcohol dependence. That's fascinating. And they did another, oh, go ahead. So I was just gonna say for Chad, um, for years, he had, he had given up alcohol. Praise the Lord, God had given him Wasn't victory. smoking wasn't anymore. Wasn't smoking, wasn't drinking. But he still had this like edginess of still feeling like an addict, right? Not, not at peace until he like healed his gut and one of the things he realized was the spices were irritating his gut and once, once he healed it of that, he's like, oh, this is what normal people must feel like. You know, like just at peace and not always like edgy or wanting something or just always fighting. And going further in a study in the British Medical Journal of nearly 500,000 people, it was found that those who ate more spicy food smoked more tobacco and drank more alcohol. If you struggle with any kind of addiction, and even if you don't, I'll actually, I, I, we'll go even further. I show, we show research that people who eat more spicy food are more prone to aggressive cognition, actually being angry and thinking other people are being angry with them, even if they're not being angry with them. Meaning, so it's just this cognition of I'm aggressive and thinking people are aggressive even when they're not. And so, but 
what might be some of the, the what is taking place? In, in the research shows that what happens is you eat these, uh, several of these spices, it opens up the junctions of the intestines, it causes inflammation in the intestines, and can cause things like bacteria and what are called endotoxins to pass right through the lining of the gut into the bloodstream, and it can cause inflammation. This can also cause trouble to the brain as a result of it. But what about spices and depression? Study of 1,771 college students tested with the DASS, which is the Depression and Anxiety Stress Scale, found that consumption of spicy food was associated with depression symptoms. With more spice connected to more depression, even just one or two days a week increased the chances of people being depressed. So spices make people more prone to being depressed. And actually, I, as I said, I struggled with 11 years of depression. And when I got rid of the spices, fascinatingly, the depression went away. There were, there were some other factors, but that was one of the main factors that took place. And one more, uh, two more slides on spices. The same study found that eating spicy food greater than or equal to three days a week increased the chances of struggling with anxiety by 50%. Now we saw eating it just one day a week increases rates of depression, but eating it also increases rates of anxiety. And we were told in something called Christian temperance and Bible hygiene, spices at first irritate the tender coating of the stomach, but finally destroy the natural sensitiveness of this delicate membrane. It's exactly what the research now shows today. The blood becomes fevered, the animal propensities are aroused, while the moral and intellectual powers are weakened and become servants to the baser passions. So once again, you might be thinking, hey, I eat it some days and I don't eat it the other days and I don't see any difference on either of the days. I used to say the same thing. Until we took it out of our diet for a couple of weeks and then both of us started to calm down. As we've shared before, we, we would struggle with anger in our house regularly. Like most every day we would argue actually, to be honest, for years until we changed our diet, got rid of this, and it didn't change the first day after we quit it, or the second, or the third, or the fourth, or even a week later, but it took like a week or more before our gut started to calm down, that inflammation started to calm down, and then our brain started to calm down, and our marriage got better and better. And then his social anxiety just went away, because he would be up here speaking, but then afterwards he just wanted to run home and not talk to anybody, and, and physically it was like harming him to speak up front. I would just be so stressed. And um, after, you know, so a lot of people call themselves introverts, right? Oh yeah, I used to think of myself as an introvert. But then we try this, and the next thing I know, he's like, wow, he's being so social with everybody. Now I <laughs> can know? spend time all day, every day with people, and I don't have that problem anymore. It literally changed my life. So if you struggle with anxiety, depression, any kind of habitual negative o thoughts, could OCD. be temptation, OCD, these kind of things, or social phobia, these kind of things, that if you let go of this, you're not going to notice the first day or second day or third day, maybe in the fifth day you won't. And then the addiction of lust as well it's is affected by this. Massively. It is incredible. I believe there's many people who never overcome pornography until they are willing to give up the spicy food. So we'll go forward though. Fadi, why don't you tell us, I think, yeah, why don't you, this is important in the area of addiction. Researchers from the University of South Florida conducted four uh, different studies to see the impact of caffeine on behavior. They had people upon entering a store have a free complimentary caffeinated drink, a decaf drink or water. Those who drank the caffeinated drink spent 50% more money while in the store. Now you know why they have complimentary coffee at a lot of stores. Pretty slick move, isn't it? Because that's like nothing <laughs> compared to 50% more out of you. <laughs> yeah, what's it cost them? 25 cents for a cup of coffee? And if you spend 50% more money, it was a well-invested, it was a good investment on their part. Uh, but then another study from, the, from University of South Florida, they did four, another one of them showed that online shoppers also were more prone to to more impulse purchases while on caffeine. And they state that caffeine makes people more impulsive and lowers levels of self-control. Now that's interesting. When we're looking to overcome a bad habit, 
one of the things we need more of is self-control. Now, when you drink alcohol, does that help or hurt your self-control? Obviously it hurts, right? Obviously you don't, you don't have a few drinks and go, boy, that's just really helping out my morals tonight, right? That doesn't happen. And you say, well, come on, it's not the same degree with caffeine. No, not to the same capacity, but regardless, it actually still lowers levels of self-control. And you find out often people who are smokers, which, of which I was, what would I do first thing in the morning? You get up and have a coffee or have some soda, and then you also have what? You have a cigarette, right? And so these things actually often work together, right? And so this fits exactly. Look, self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And caffeine lowers levels of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. What do we see? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and what? Self, oh, sorry, uh, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. So what does it say? One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, and caffeine actually lowers our ability to have the Spirit working in our lives, just like alcohol does and other drugs for that matter. Obviously not to the same capacity, but those of us who are struggling with any kind of bad habit or addiction or repetitive thought, we don't want just to like lower our ability to overcome even a little bit, Right? The more strength we have, the more self-control we have, the better off we will be. Well, we're going to jump past that and look at two types of stress. Acute stress is stress that has a trigger event um, or experience that is then speedily overcome. These types of experiences can benefit your health. Chronic stress is stress that continues for long periods of time this can be detrimental to both your mental and physical health. It can even negatively impact your immune system. I'll give you a quick example of acute stress. I, I went for a run, and I was in Illinois at the time, and a Rottweiler, it was barking at me, but it was on a chain, so I wasn't you know, real worried. But then it pulled kind of backward, and I saw the, I saw the chain fall off. And when, when, I, when, I, saw, sorry, when, I, when I saw the chain fall off, there was no fence, and I knew that I was a running target, right? And so I also know you don't run in that situation because it's, you know, really going to come after you then. So I try to stand my ground, but it's a Rottweiler, and it's a really big dog, and so I'm, I'm just, you know, trying to get it to, you know, stop. And it's barking like crazy. Now, as that happens, my blood pressure goes up, my heart rate goes up, my breathing becomes more rapid and shallow, and I'm not cognitively thinking about those. I'm not thinking, oh, my heart rate is going up. My blood pressure, oh, look at that. My blood pressure is going up. You don't notice that, but when you're in a stressful event, those are the physiological responses that take place in your body, along with increase in stress hormones, like, uh, you know, could be either cortisol or having, uh, what's the other one, like cortisol? I, shame on us. Uh, Adrenaline. Yeah, there you go. One of the most common ones you should know of, and it's, my mind is slipping there. But nevertheless, these things begin to surge through your body. That's an example. Now, then the owner came out of the house and grabbed the dog, and so I didn't struggle with repetitive negative thoughts like, oh, Rottweilers, they're coming after me, right? No, it was done. I knew it was done. It, that's acute stress. And chronic stress is when you go over and over this. We must have cut off the... Uh, what they ended up finding was that the acute stress situations can actually enhance your immune system. It can actually enhance your immune function. And what they found was that having but repetitive stress, this chronic stress that you're having all the time, you're just going over the same thing over and over, it actually can be detrimental to your immune system. 34 people were put into uh, one of two groups. One group would be put into the passive stress group. They would have to watch an invasive surgery for 12 minutes. If you're a doctor and you're used to that, probably doesn't cause you any stress, but the rest of us, that might be kind of stressful. The second group, the active stress group, would have to study information and take a 12-minute test. And the group that had active stress had a benefit to their immune function, while the group that had to passively watch the video had a negative impact on their immune function. So active stress may, from time to time, have a benefit to your health. And so remember in the beginning, the illustrations we gave about fear and doing something about the fear, this is the same thing that active stress means. You're proactively doing something 
uh, with that stress. It's stressful to take a test, but if you study and prepare for it, it's less stressful. And right. by the way, I'll, I'll just be open and honest. I, there's no reason on earth that during COVID that the top professionals in our country who were telling us what to do, they knew the thing about the weight loss and so forth. We're one of the heaviest countries in the world. It would have been the greatest time for them to say, hey, as a nation, why don't we work together? Why don't we encourage each other? Those of you who are struggling with this, we can work together. And just that activity of actively seeking to do that could have enhanced the health and the mental health of people and so I really honestly think it was a travesty not doing anything like that. It was just, just wait for them to figure out a vaccine. There's nothing we can do. We just have to wait. And that wasn't true. We knew that very, very early on. We know about psychology. We have the top scientists in the world. It was quite obvious that they could have done this. We, I was even thinking that early on. We know this. Why aren't, we, why aren't they saying anything? And the reality was it, it would have made a significant difference in people's lives, even just mentally feeling better about being active rather than passive in the stress that they were struggling with. And now, speaking of activity, this is fascinating. A number of years ago, I read a book called Spark, The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise and the Brain. In smokers, just five minutes of intense exercise can be beneficial. Exercise fights the urge to smoke because in addition to smoothly increasing dopamine, it also lowers anxiety, tension, and stress levels. The fact that exercise sharpens thinking comes into play here because one of the withdrawal symptoms of nicotine is impaired focus. And so this is a way to help focus better. And it says, researchers found that exercise dramatically reduced withdrawal symptoms in the exercise and morphine group when they cut off the drugs. So again, to deal with the cravings, one of the things you want to do is get up and move. Go out for a walk, get some fresh air, sunshine, and move your body because that's how you stimulate your blood instead of through a substance. God made it that we stimulate our blood through exercise. And a lot of times when we come home and we're tired from work or whatever, what do we want to do? We want to veg out, right? We want to sit in front of the television, the computer, the phone, whatever it is, and just zone out. Because why? We want to shut down the frontal lobe for a little bit so that we don't have to think about things. But guess what shuts down your frontal lobe during the activity but has a benefit? Exercise. During the act of exercise, your frontal lobe does shut down a little bit. It does decrease. But guess what happens right after? It just increases. And so if you want to veg out, the best way to veg out in your brain is to go and exercise. God has given us a way to veg out. And especially if you do it in the outdoors and you look at the beauty of nature, it really helps you veg out in a good way, right? Because you're actively doing something to help the brain to just relax for a little bit and think about nothing but good things. Look at nature and, and just walk through nature and enjoy it. It'll really help enhance your brain. So then afterwards, then your, your frontal lobe is really operative and you make better decisions. But think about if you came home and just vegged out in front of the television, computer, whatever, how do you feel afterwards? Do you feel as accomplished, or do you feel great about what you just did? No, we usually don't. And um, it's just such a blessing when you realize we're all longing for these things, but we're artificially doing it. And instead, we should just go out and do the real thing and walk, right? Walk, exercise, do whatever you need to do. And I love this study here. Researchers put marijuana smokers who did not want to quit on an exercise program. So these guys are like, hey, I have no desire to quit. I don't want to quit. And they're like, okay, we're going to put you on an exercise program. They did 10 30-minute runs over the course of two weeks. It lowered their cravings by 50%. Exercise also helps smokers and narcotic users overcome their addictions. And so you say, well, 50%, that's pretty good, but that's not 100%. But these guys didn't want to quit. How much more powerful would it be if you desire to quit? Right? Where you're like, man, I want to quit. And so you begin to actively exercise you'll see that there's a great power. Placebo effect is not a bad thing in and of itself. Like there, actually, there wasn't much of a placebo effect because these guys didn't want it. They didn't want even the benefit. They actually just wanted to keep smoking pot. 
but nevertheless, by putting them on an exercise program, as they're getting their endorphins up through exercise, you start feeling better. People who exercise have lower levels of depression statistically, and so you can imagine if you're less depressed, if you feel less bad, you start feeling better, you're less prone to go to your cigarette, to your alcohol, to your marijuana, or, or in the other or study. stimulating food. Yeah, stimulating food, whatever it is. As you feel happier, you're more willing to do other things that may be actually better for you. And I forgot to mention this too. When the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, they went through, they gave an order of the, the most likely comorbidities during COVID. Number one, once again, was being overweight. Number two was a massive surprise, according to the NIH. Number two was fear-related disorders. So the second most likely thing to have be a comorbidity to those people who are having severe COVID was actually fear, having fear of it, right? And so, and once again, yeah. yeah, and many people were sitting around. Some people obviously could work. Other people had jobs that were considered non-essential, and others had the, the so-called essential jobs. But you realize how that could be, that sitting around could make you more fear, fearful, but exercise helps lower levels of anxiety, stress, and depression. Now, we talked about four things, or three things last night. We added one tonight, but we talked about Bible promises, how important that is. There's Bible promise books. We should, like, take those around with us, but there's Bible promise books that have promises on anything you can almost think of. If you struggle with anxiety, there's Bible promises for that, like Philippians 4, verse 6, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. There's promises for anger. Like you read back in Proverbs chapter 15, where it says, how's it go? A soft, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger, right? And so a soft answer. Okay, Lord, I feel like just yelling at this person, but you told me that a soft answer will help out. It'll make the situation better. So speaking kindly to somebody who may be frustrated with you, right? And so claiming the promises, turning a Father, help me to live by your word. And as we turn to him, number one, we're focusing in the frontal lobe, we're connecting with the Father who gives us the Holy Spirit to give us strength, and that's what we need in our times of trial. And also we talked about breathing accurately, deep breathing. We talked about drinking water, how that can lower levels of depression, anxiety. And tonight we added one simple thing is exercise. And you may say, Chad, those things are pretty simple. They are. They are. But how many people every day are drinking fresh water daily instead of drinking soda and coffee and all kinds of things? Most people are not just doing that. And exercise, what percentage of people? Not the majority of people are getting significant exercise daily. They're not. And how many people are claiming promises? These four things, we're going to look at more as we go forward in the seminar, but these are some things to really implement so that you find peace in the midst of your trials. Now, I want to look at some causes of chronic stress. Uh, one of the things can be a past experience that you go over and over in your mind. And another one can be hating your present life. You know, we, back to the first one, though, the going over and over the same thing and negative, uh, uh, negative thoughts about a past experience, they call that rumination. Just like a, a cow is called a ruminant. They're an animal that what they do is they chew and chew and chew and chew. And if you've ever watched it, when I do a seminar and I show what the Bible talks about chewing the cud, I actually went and recorded, a, it was a, what was it, an antelope. And, and, and so he's chewing, 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 and then you can see him swallow, you know, you can, you can see it go down the throat, you know, you can see the, uh, I don't know if they call it an Adam's, Adam's apple on an on a antelope, but nevertheless, you can see him swallowing, and then he sits there for a little bit, and you see the reverse action. You can see it come back up, and he starts chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing. That's rumination. And we do that in our minds by taking up that old thought and bringing it back to the surface. That's one of the things that can cause us stress. Hating your present life, not forgiving someone, or being in an unhealthy relationship. These are things, some things that can cause, there's all kinds of things that really can. But I want you to think about this for a moment. How many of you like the flavor of lemons? Anybody like lemons? Wow, most everybody, that's pretty amazing. I, I love the taste of a lemon. Um, obviously I put too much in my mouth and my teeth get sore, it's so 
sour, you know, the acidity there, but I love the flavor of it. And if I told you right now to stop thinking about lemons, what are you going to think about? Lemons, right? If I say stop thinking about lemons, they're like, man, I can't stop thinking about lemons. It's like, you weren't even thinking about them 30 seconds ago, and now that I said stop thinking about them, you can't stop thinking about them, right? And the idea is, is if you have a temptation, like, well, actually, we'll come back to that. How many of you like apples? Anybody like apples? What's your favorite kind of apple? Red Delicious. You like Red Delicious? All right. I like Red Delicious when, now, I don't just eat organic, but there's a big difference between the taste of an organic Red Delicious and regular ones. I think normal ones in the store taste like grass. But when it's organic, they're actually fantastic. But anybody else? Somebody said Pink Lady. Someone said Fuji. Honeycrisp. You know, it's fascinating. They actually, it's not genetically modified. They, they took pollen from a Honeycrisp and gave it to the Fuji, and then they took seeds from that. They planted 40,000 seeds to see. They say uh, if you plant apple seeds, you have about a 1 in 30,000 chance of having a good apple tree. That's why they're all grafted. You actually cut branches off trees. You don't, you don't plant them by seed generally. But you have to plant about 30,000 to get a good tree. And so they did that, though. They just, because it's genetically like a man and a woman coming together, you know, you don't know exactly what their child's going to look like. Same thing happens when they, the pollen takes it from one tree to another. It creates the seed in the apple. You plant that seed. Well, long story short, they mix Fuji and Honeycrisp. And out of 40,000 different trees, they found one super good one, and they call it Evercrisp. And it's fantastic. Actually, when it's fresh, it can taste like grape candy. It's just really amazing. And it can sit in your fridge for a year. That's why it's called Evercrisp. What are we thinking about now? Apples, right? You see how you can choose what you think about. Do you understand what I'm saying? God has given us the capacity, but what if, what if I just kept saying for 10 minutes, don't think about lemons? Don't think about lemons. What would you think about all of those 10 minutes? You would think about lemons. And the point is that God doesn't want us to say, okay, man, I feel like having a cigarette. Oh, I shouldn't think about smoking. Ah, I shouldn't think about having another smoke. Oh, I remember all those times smoking, right? I shouldn't think about that. Well, what am I going to think about if I tell myself not to think about it? I'm going to think about smoking. But if instead I turn my mind to something better, and God has given us, like we said, his promises. So we turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 57, I was thinking that was wrong. Yeah, 51 is about death, but nevertheless. So 57 is thanks be to God, which gives us the victory. That's a good one to memorize if you haven't memorized it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57 and 8, it says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So you say, Father, you promised to give me the victory. I, I don't have it on my own, but I know you have the power. And thank you that you can give me the victory. And you tell me to be steadfast, unmovable, going forward. And Father, I know that as you help me go forward, you will give me the true victory. Am I thinking about smoking now? No. I'm thinking about God and his power and trusting in him by faith. And as we trust him, we gain the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't focus on the sin. Don't focus on the bad thoughts, the repetitive thoughts. Instead, turn your mind to God's Word. Well, can reading lower stress levels? Research out of the University of Sussex looked at the effects of different activities on stress levels. Two physical reactions to stress are increasing stress hormones and increasing heart rate. The researchers had subjects increase their heart rates by certain exercises or tests, and then they tried different methods of relaxation. These included activities like going on a walk, listening to music, and also reading. What did they find? It turned out that the most powerful method of lowering stress in this particular study, the lowering stress levels was reading. Simply reading for as little as six minutes can lower stress levels by approximately 68%. Imagine lowering your stress by nearly 70% in six minutes by simply 
reading. How powerful is that? And I may have shared this before, but if God knew this, if, knew, if God knew that reading was so beneficial, why didn't he simply tell us? Well, he did. Revelation 1 verse 3 says, blessed, that word means happy. Happy is he that what? Reads. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Happy are the ones who read. And friends, that's why you don't want to miss a day without spending time with Jesus and his word. Every day. I, when I was struggling with addictions, and so I, I was, I'd read God's word, and I'd go a few days without smoking or drinking or whatever, and, and then, you know, after a while, I'd kind of let go of that, and then I'd start going back to my old habits. And finally, I realized it's not an option for me. I don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, am I going to have time with Jesus today? No, it, it, that is what I do. No matter how busy I am, no matter what's going on, Jesus comes first, right? There is time for Jesus if we put him first, if we choose to do that. A couple friends of mine, one by the name of Vasili, and the other one is Chad. Now, I'm also Chad, but another friend named Chad. And Chad was, he had this dog. You know how some people are really good at training dogs, and some people aren't, right? And Chad was one who wasn't. And so he had this dog that was just crazy, just, just jumping all over the place, doing things crazy all the time. But Vasily had this unbelievably well-trained dog. And they lived near each other, and Chad said to Vasily, he's like, hey, Vasily, how, how did you get your dog to be so well-trained? And Vasily said, oh, I, it's actually very simple. He said, what I do is, uh, when I first got my dog, he was just as crazy as yours. But what I did was, every morning at the same time I would get up, I would go to the door and call him, and then I would put him on a leash, and I would take him out into the forest, into an area where nobody was, into an open area in the forest, and then I would take him off his leash and just let him run. There was nobody out there. There was no worry about him doing anything bad out there. And he'd just run free. And then after he had done it for a while, I'd call him. He'd come back, put him on the leash, and I'd bring him home. Did the same thing the next day and the next day. And every day he did the same thing. And he said that what happened was, after time, he said he will do whatever I ask him to do because he has learned to associate me with freedom. Isn't that powerful? That my dog will do anything I ask him to do because he's learned to associate me, not with bondage, not with a leash, a leash. He's learned to associate me with freedom. And so too with God. Jesus actually tells us in John chapter 8, verse 32, he says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you a slave. Actually, he says, no, the truth shall make you what? Free. Free. And really, because people think, oh, you're a Christian, you can't do drugs, or you can't do this or that or whatever. It's like, can't do it. I've been set free from that stuff. That's freedom. It's not freedom to be stuck doing drugs or addicted. To That's not freedom. That is slavery. Yes or no? But Jesus came to show us the way of truth. And as we receive that truth, he sets us free with that. Jesus wants to give us victory over our bad habits, whatever they may be. Now, I want to challenge you. If there's something in your life that God is calling you to give up, don't, like for instance, uh, you know, you're trying to overcome cigarettes, and you're like, well, I got a carton at home. I'll, I'll leave it in the cupboard just in case I want to go back to it. Is that a good idea? No. What should you do with it? Throw it away. We've had the opportunity of, uh, you know, people come to the meetings. We say, hey, if you can't get rid of it yourself, you can bring it to us. And, you know, somebody comes to us with a meth pipe, and my wife sticks the meth pipe in our purse, and then we drive home. Well, I'm glad we didn't get pulled over by the cops. Right? <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, likely story. Somebody was trying to overcome, and they gave you their meth pipe, right? Uh, but we did destroy the meth pipe. And, and, and the fact is, if you can't get rid of something, we'll help you get rid of it if you want to. We're not saying you have to come to us for that, but if you need that help, we can do it. My wife's been able to help, you know, dump alcohol down the toilet and these kind of things with people. And, and if you need, the, you know, need to do that, great. But if you don't, just get rid of it. But don't just stick it in the garbage and know it's there because what, what will happen tomorrow if you're really struggling again? You're like, man, I know that whole carton's right out there. You got to go get rid of that thing, right? Just get rid of it is one of the best things you can do or whatever it is that you end up struggling with. But if God, if God is asking you to get, some, get rid of something, maybe you need to get 100% rid of it. 
Is he putting something on your heart? If he is, as we pray right now, I, I want to just challenge you to bring it to him. I'm going to give a little short time of pause where you can say, Father, I want, to, I want to give this to you, and I want you to help me gain the victory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the power that you have. Lord, we, we want to be overcomers. I know exactly what it's like to struggle with alcohol, to struggle with tobacco, drinking myself to sleep at night. But I also know what it's like to gain the victory, not, not by my own strength or my own determination or my own grit, but completely by the power of Jesus Christ. And now I know what it's like to not even want a cigarette, not even desire alcohol, that you can literally get us to the point. This idea that we'll struggle with it for the rest of our lives, that doesn't have to necessarily be the case. It may come back from time to time. That doesn't mean we're not walking with you. We realize that, Father. But we, in the beginning, we recognize it's the hardest, but in time, you make it easier and easier. And my prayer is just now that we'll bring it to you. Lord, we come to you just as we are because that's the only way we can come to you. We don't clean ourselves up and then come to you. We come to you just with what we have and what we are. And we thank you that we can't clean ourselves. You do all the cleaning. And we're saved not by even the fact that we're clean. We're saved by grace through faith and that we're covered with the robe of Jesus' righteousness. But we realize that he doesn't leave us just with a covering. He begins to fill us on the inside. Lord, fill us with your spirit that we may find victory through our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, um, that was tonight, was Wednesday. Tomorrow is going to be a secret weapon to overcome habits, a secret weapon. You don't want to miss Thursday night. Friday will be coming, overcoming media addiction. Even if you don't struggle with it, I guarantee you're around people that do, and you can learn these principles and help others. Saturday morning will be power for victory But before we go, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask before we go forward? The mic. Is that still on? Oh, thank you, brother. Anybody have any questions? Uh, Brother in the bag. Douglas? or uh, Douglas, yes. We met last night. What, What was the question? Where do you get Evercrisp apples? Two, the, I'm guessing in a few years they'll be more common. It's random. I've, I've only seen them in a few different grocery stores, and it's never been consistent. So I can't really say. I saw them. There's a place in Texas called H-E-B. I've seen them in Texas. We've seen them in Michigan. But it's really hit or miss. So if you're ever in any store and you see Evercrisp apples... Give it a try if you like apples anyway. They're not always like grape candy. That's only certain times. I've had them where they're good, but not like grape candy. They are almost too hard. That's why they're crisp. Uh, They're like more crisp than a honey crisp. But they are, to me, when they're ripe, they're amazing. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. When you say spicy food, um define that a little bit more does that mean jalapenos and paprika and you said jalapenos and then what was the second one paprika paprika strangely enough and i'm not telling i mean so i don't know okay they did a study specifically looking at the increased intestinal permeability in certain spices and because when we do a longer seminar we share the research on this stuff but um what they what they found is now I don't know what kind of paprika they use because there is a spicy paprika and then there's the standard American paprika that has no spice to it whatsoever. But it's technically a spice, but it's not spicy. Um, But the research showed whatever one they used in that study did increase intestinal permeability. So I'm not like here to tell you you can't eat paprika, but if you struggle with some of these things, yes, jalapenos, yes, these kind of things, things like in the same study, cayenne increased intestinal permeability. That actually is something specifically that does it. And so um, anything for sure that has a spiciness, but strangely enough, some things are detrimental and can cause lust or anger, even that are not spicy. And so I'm not going to tell you exactly what you have to do or can or can't do with that, but if you really struggle with depression, anxiety, I would try going on a temporary, just bland diet of eating potatoes with some salt on it, eating some sweet... I mean, I know this sounds extreme, but if you did it for a couple weeks and your 11 years of depression like I had went away, it would be worth eating simple food for two weeks. 
I mean, it literally changed my life. And I'm not saying you have to do it. I'm, I'm the biggest believer in freedom of choice and not pushing people. But I also love people coming to me and telling me, I tried what you said and it's changed my family. It's changed my life. And now I'm not yelling at my children anymore. I mean, what a, do you know how nice it is to have somebody come and tell you that? It, it's, it's powerful. Or people saying, you know, I came and I tried what you said, my depression went away. And so it, I can't tell you exactly because they haven't studied everyone to figure it out. Um, I don't know that we totally know, but I would just, if you really struggle with anxiety, depression, lust, uh, these various different things or addictions, try just temporarily going, I, I would even go a month actually, because it may start just getting away after a couple weeks. But something to try. Any, any, any other? Yes, because it takes time for the gut to heal. And that, because for instance, if I kicked my shin, I mean, God forbid, I kicked my shin on here real hard accidentally and cut it, that it causes inflammation. If I woke up tomorrow with the inflammation, if I cut it open, would it be completely gone by tomorrow? No, it's going to take weeks to heal the inflammation, and the same thing can happen in the intestines. Any other questions? Well, it doesn't look like it. Thank, one more thing before we go. We, we have our DVDs in the back, and we also have a cookbook that has something in it. It has two different kinds. It has tons of different recipes, but it has standard plant-based recipes, but then it has also something called the therapeutic diet. They have a letter T in front of them. Not everyone does. And that one is incredible. I mean, they're all good, but the ones with the T are like similar to the Esselstein diet to help reverse heart disease, potentially. I mean, it's the only way that's been proven. And it also can help with depression, anxiety. This book fits a lot with what we say, so if you have any interest, there's some on the way. I mean, you, you're, my wife will be out there with them and DVDs if you have any interest. Thank you for coming. A secret weapon to overcome habits will be tomorrow night. God bless. Have a great night.